and the discussion for this evening is going to be Buddha Dharma. And when I made the the choice, I should have actually called it Buddha Dharma from a holistic approach. However, since then, I realized that this evening's format is going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to talk about the Buddha Dharma with a short period of questions and answers and uh, the Buddha Dharma is a holistic approach uh, with some questions and answers. And this is going to be followed by a short discussion by Dr. Joe Jindo with some questions and answers. And the rest of the evening will be as usual. And I, I, as I said before, uh, Koshin is staying home with COVID and co staying home with uh, Harper, his daughter, in COVID. Uh, so Kaiden will be continuing the Zoom service in the house. Um, and Shuman will be my assistant, my goji. Um, and just to let you know that, that we're going, that Dr. Jindo and myself are going to try to do something uh, in the coming weeks, and that's why he wants to, to talk about it tonight. But let's begin my discussion first. We'll talk more about that later. The Dharma, as everyone knows, is one of the three jewels in addition to the Buddha and the Sangha. And there's no really good direct translation in English, though the term teachings is most often agreed upon usage. Um, the root of the term Dharma is Dhyu, which has the sense to bear, sustain, <coughs> hold, support. And in Sanskrit, it is a factor or an element. So that's the general background. In the early Vedic literature, it was used to refer to sacrifice in order to maintain the order of the cosmos. This will be important in just a moment. And I just wanted to point out that there's a relationship between the term sacred and sacrifice by virtue of the rites. Rites meaning R-I-T-E-S, the ceremonies, that sort of thing that are held to sanctify something. And so when we talk about sacrifice, it is a type of ritual, and that ritual is intended to make sacred. So sacrifice and sacred, I'm not saying they have etymologically the same, the same root, but they have a relationship. And, and I've often looked at the term sacred and the relationship of the term sacrifice and one of the things that struck me is that one of the distinctions between um, when we when we talk about religion with quotes around the term religion, and we hear people say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. One of the things I think that is lost in that is that the idea of religion often requires sacrifice where being spiritual quote unquote, in today's vernacular, does not require sacrifice. In other words, what are you going to do for the sacrility if one is, if one is religious or one is, is spiritual? Uh, that I think that's one of the, the interesting little side notes there. And an animal sacrifice was made by the Brahmins in order to appease various deities. And so when you use the term dharma, it's really interesting that it goes back to the early Vedic period when the Brahmins were sacrificing a ram, for instance. Uh, and then that ram would then be portioned out to the village um, as, as the ram was used as a sacrifice to keep the cosmos into order. But then the ram was, was portioned out to the village. Most people aren't aware of the fact that the Brahmins Today, or the Brahmins have been for the last several thousand years, totally vegetarian, but they actually started out as the one who would make the animal sacrifices. Uh, there was a, a ecological disaster in India, and as a result of that, they switched from sacrificing cattle to using cattle for work and for milk rather than for rather than for meat. Um, Anyway, in this context, we arrive at the first of the three meanings of the Dharma. And that refers to the natural order or universal law that underpins the operation of the universe in both spiritual and moral spheres. 
The, se the second meaning is denoted by the totality of Buddhist teachings, since they are thought to accurately describe and explain the underpinnings of the universal law, so that individuals may live in, live in harmony with it. And this is the sense that we find it in the three jewels. So when we're talking about the Dharma in the three jewels, that's the sense of it, even though the Dharma as a whole encompasses three distinct areas. Most often we're referring to the second of those, which is the, the totality of the Buddhist teaching. The third meaning refers to individual elements that collectively constitute the empirical world, and some of those elements are external to the perceiver. And by that, what is meant is that the Dharma is not just a collection of aphorisms, which it is at, at one level. It's discourses by Shakyamuni Buddha. The canonical works are discourses by, the, by Shakyamuni Buddha, but they're also aphorisms. The Dhammapada, as an example, is a collection of aphorisms that were collected together to represent basically to a broad public what the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha were. Um, and it's this third meaning to which we often refer to as the living the Dharma. In other words, we can talk about the Dharma as a collection of, we can talk about the Dharma as a world system. We can talk about the Dharma as a the canonical works and the, all the teachings. That would be the sutras, the Vinaya, the Abhidharma, the Shastra, the various commentaries are made by people like Nagarjuna, et cetera. That's all Dharma. Um, Jitaka tales, these are all understandable as Dharma. And then the third level is how do we live within that system? How do we live within that system? <clears throat> so often, when we refer to the Dharma, we really think about the teachings as they relate to the sutras, the Vinaya, the Shastra, etc. It also implies the practice, both those practices such as meditation and chanting, but also the virtue of the Vinaya. It implies the practice of morality and ethics. When we talk about Buddhist practice, uh, you know, you, many people have heard me say there's really only one true Buddhist practice, and that's compassion. But we often hear people say, well, my practice is, is I do daimokyu, I do the recitation of the title of the Lotus Sutra, or my practice is I do meditation. Um, but morality and ethics is also an integral part of Buddhist practice. And I would even extend that to say that we, we have, uh, when we think about morality and ethics, we're not just limiting that to, let's say the five lay um, practices that we stipulate when one takes refuge, not to kill, not to steal, not to bear false witness, et cetera, but also Morality, as in terms of how we treat the planet, how we treat each, how we treat each other, it goes beyond just the five big ones, so to speak, or the ten if one is taken <laughs> Tokido. Um, more about that in, in a little bit. When we're dealing with Dharma as a canonical working, it can also be somewhat confusing because the teachings developed over long periods of time, employing different philosophies. And these, philosoph these philosophies were an explor exploration of the nature of reality, as opposed to declarations by a deity on the nature of reality. Thus, Sutra A can contradict Sutra B in very profound methods. And that seems really confusing to people. How come in this Sutra it says this, and in this Sutra it says something totally different? It, 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 it contradicts it. It depends upon whether you're dealing with Pali or Sanskrit text, whether, as an example, um, when one hears the term, thus have I heard, which is one of the things that denotes that one is reading a sutra as opposed to another, another issue, often people take that to mean 
Thus have I heard Shakyamuni Buddha. But the question is, who was the hearer? And this depends on, typically we assume it to be Ananda because by the earliest Pali canon, it was Ananda who at the first council, first Buddhist council after Shakyamuni Buddha's death, a collection of, of approximately 100 monks got together, monks and nuns, I should say, got together and discussed, well, what did Shakyamuni Buddha say? And Ananda is the one without going into the detail who as his attendant was able to provide an almost um, blow by blow description of whatever the discourse was. So often we take that to mean Ananda. But in fact, when we read other works such as the Lotus Sutra, it could be uh, someone such as Manjushri or Vajipani or some other Bodhisattva. So who was the hearer is one of the issues that we, that we discuss when we're talking about sutra, part of the Dharma. The other part of that is, who was it that was speaking? We often want to think, oh, that was Shakyamuni Buddha. But we know from some of the sutras, as well as historic texts, that it wasn't just Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings that were being revealed. That his chief disciples, such people as Shari Putra and Mahamalviana, were giving discourses. Some of the, his disciples' disciples were giving discourses. And furthermore, Bodhisattvas were giving discourses. So when it says, thus have I heard, or thus did I hear, who was the speaker and who was the person who was reporting it? Um, those two issues begin to clear up the, the notion of why do we find such contradictions between sutras? Because you've got one, uh, one disciple who's giving a, a group of teachings. Now, if, before I go on, I should say that normally before those teachings were, they were oral, they were not initially written down. They weren't written down for several hundred years after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. They were oral, but even being passed on as oral traditions, they were very often, or they, they had to pass muster among the council, among the, the collection of monks to say, yes, this is, this is something that we approve, even whether it was from Shakyamuni Buddha or was not from Shakyamuni Buddha. So um, that was really in, important. And the issue of authenticity of the Buddha's words has been an issue from the very earliest teachings. This isn't something that came out, um, you know, 500 years after Shakyamuni Buddha's death or a thousand years or 1500 years. This was occurring at the time that he was shortly after his death, I should say. I mean, nobody was really questioning at the time, but shortly after his death, there's a question, well, what is the authenticity of this particular teaching? And like I say, keep in mind that, that these sutra were often, I, I think that we in the West, I have to put it that way, that we in the West come from a tradition of, from the Abrahamic tradition in which there is an authority by virtue of the book itself. That is to say, we know that Hashem, God, gave the tablets to Moses. And if somebody hadn't misplaced them, we would have them today. I don't know who misplaced them. Somebody's got to pay for this. I'll tell you right now. But the, that indicated that Hashem, God, was speaking. There's, a, there's a, a divine authority that was providing that information. In the case of the sutra, they were basically presenting works that were philosophy in process. That is to say, my good friend John here feels this way about emptiness, and my good friend Jane over there has another feeling, and they're both writing about this, and he's saying one thing and she's saying something else, and then the rest of us are all looking at this, oh, John's got a good point, Jane's got a good point. 
and we would have this discussion, spirited discussion. In other words, it's not something that is written in stone that says that this is this has to be the way it is. And I think that some many times, coming from a Western Abrahamic tradition, we treat the canonical works as though they were handed down from the mount as God handed them down to Moses. And, and then that's not the that's not the situation. Don't get me wrong, I don't for a moment believe, by the way, whether it's Jewish or Christian or Muslim, that it was quite so simple. So don't get on my case, my friend. <laughs> I realize that. But it's the way we perceive it, not necessarily the way that it was presented. That, that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, <clears throat> and we must remember that Shakyamuni Buddha taught over an extended geographical area and a wide range of audiences over the course of 45 years. I can tell you right now, um, uh, you know, I taught pretty much almost 40, well, I, I taught at, in a university setting for about 40 years, a little bit over 40 years. And I can tell you that I said things in my second year of teaching that I would have laughed at in my 20th year of teaching, right? <laughs> And then would have scoffed at further in my 40th year of teaching. So those are just natural, those are just natural things. Uh, nothing that he taught was ever written down during his life. And so it was inevitable that when groups of disciples assembled to discuss what the teaching had taught, which teaching indeed would be the would be the one that was most appropriate. How did they get assembled? How did they become? authoritative is all a matter of, well, history. And that's, that's the stuff by which university professors um, receive their thesis. And thank goodness for that. Um, I'd also like to point out that the compilers of the various sutras um, grounded themselves in the basic teachings and that their explorations on the nature of reality were exactly that. They were explorations. Lopez writes in the story of Buddhism, and I quote, all Buddhist exegetes, regardless of scholastic or vehicular affiliations, I like that term, it sounds like he's driving a Tesla, were all faced with the problem of the interpretation of the sutras. It is a common tenet of all schools of Buddhism that just as a physician does not prescribe the same medicine to cure all maladies, so the Buddha did not teach the same thing to everyone. Therefore, two teachings could be the authentic word of the Buddha, yet be at odds with each other. The Buddha is said to have taught something different to different people based on his extraordinary knowledge of their interests, capacities, disposition, intelligence, and past lives. And I'd like to return for, to, for a moment to the first meaning of the term Dharma, that which refers to the natural order or universal law that underpins the operation of the universe in both spiritual and moral spheres. When we look at the foundational teachings, such as the formal noble truths and dependent origination, these are not taken to be merely doctrinal concepts. They are seen in a larger context of natural laws. That is to say, dependent origination is seen as a natural law in the same way that a physicist would look at the law of thermodynamics as a natural law. There, there's a correspondence there. And so we're not, when we're talking about the Dharma, we're talking about something that is, that is really exploring what is the nature of the way the universe is held together? What is the way the universe operates on a day-to-day -day basis. And the Dharma is not intended as an alternative to physical laws or a supplement to them. It is viewed as a fundamental law, such as gravity. And that's what makes Buddhism universal. That's one of the things that it makes it universal. It's not saying these things are true for the people on the East Coast of the United States and the people on the West Coast of the United States have a different set of laws. It says that these are true of, of people everywhere. The teachings also involve practice, that is to say, manifesting in the world those things that our teachings posit, 
non-self, selflessness, the middle way, acting as a bodhisattva, etc. That is also part of the Dharma. It's not merely proposing something, but it is saying, how do we manifest these things? And that's why we have the various teachings, such as the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, which says, here's how you begin to manifest these laws of the universe. So this has been a very cursory examination of what we refer to as the Dharma. And it's a very pointed examination. I'm not trying to provide a con concise declaration because we could do that every day for the rest of my life and we still wouldn't begin to, to uh, scratch the surface of it. Uh, but these are some, some elements that I think that we really should consider when we're discussing the Dharma. And so I'm gonna now switch to questions and answers. And I'm just gonna take a few because um, our good friend Joe has something that he would like to uh, present also. So I'm gonna unmute people. I'm gonna take two questions. So it's gotta be good. If it's a silly question, then you're in big trouble. It, it's, it's, it's 10 lifetimes of bad karma if it's a bad question. Just keep that in mind. But please, come ahead. Just be free to, you know, ask anything you like. Nobody's taking it. <laughs> no questions? Uh, uh, Chip, go ahead. Yeah, Chip, Chip doesn't believe in karma and rebirth, so he's exempt from this. Go ahead, Chip. Well, I, I think... Uh, Qi in China in the fourth century sort of was posed this question because he had people coming from India that were Theravadans and saying, this is how things is. And he had other people coming from India that were Mahayanas and saying, this is how things are. And instead of fighting and, and deciding the uh, victor is the one who, who has the most might, Qi um, was able to explain a way that they're all right, everybody's right. And what we we just have to look at their viewpoint and you'll see it's right. And it sees also it encompasses your viewpoint and the whole universe is is encompassed. So I think that's that's a good way. I'm not okay. sure whether uh, um, Americans in the 21st century are gonna buy it, but you know, we did have a, we did not have a split a uh, bad split in Buddhism between the Mahayanas and the Theravadins or the Kinyanas. But okay, you, you get two you get two lifetimes of good <laughs> good karma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Ichishima sensei, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Well the uh last message of uh, Buddha Shakyamuni when he was in Nirvana, just before Nirvana, Ananda disciple uh, asked him, Buddha, uh, what should we follow? Uh, then answer of Buddha is Jitomyo Hotomyo. You should uh, rely on your light of Dharma and light of teaching of Buddha. So the, the, these two are uh, guidance for your uh, life. I think uh, that is a very important word of Buddha. Okay? Thank you, Sansai. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the writings of Nagarjuna happened uh, during his lifetime? You mean Nagarjuna's lifetime? Yeah. Yes. And uh, how should we regard those? We should regard those as um, exceptionally informed and insightful uh, teachings based upon the insight that he had of the Dharma as he interpreted it. Okay. Were, you, were you thinking like, like Sutra or Shastra or? I was just going to say because I, I think like he he didn't write any sutra necessarily. Right. They were all no. based on sutra. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it there. Stop the questions there and go on to uh, Job and Job. So, um, when the Buddha was nearing the end of his life, several of the key disciples, and as we get the tellings from Mahayana sutras later, uh, many great Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, the greatest of the great Bodhisattvas, had a lot of questions, right? Because they understand that their teacher is going to die soon. And I mean, what are you going to do, right? Like, who are you going to ask for help after the Buddha's gone from the world? In the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings, there's a bodhisattva called Great Adornment, and he's a sort of larger than life celestial bodhisattva. And he says, well, he has a question for the Buddha on behalf of everyone who's there to hear the Buddha speak today. And the Buddha says, well, I don't have that much time left, so please go ahead and ask, right? I'll tell you what you want to know. And his question is, so what can bodhisattvas do that's the most efficient, the quickest way to achieve supreme great awakening, right? How can we get there as soon as possible to be able to help other people? And uh, actually, I'm just going to read the answer to you because it's only three sentences. So here it is. Bodhisattvas who want to learn and practice innumerable meanings, which is the teaching that will lead you there the fastest should observe that at every point in time, all things themselves are tranquil and empty in nature and attributes. They are neither great nor small, without origination or cessation, neither fixed nor moving, and neither advancing nor retreating. They are non-dual, just like empty space. And you can imagine, of course, that at this point, everybody did not pack their things up. They waited to hear more, even though this was the answer. It seems fairly simple, though. It's a three-sentence answer. This is the fast way to supreme great awakening. Just realize the emptiness of all things. But the Buddha continues. He says that really there's kind of a problem, right? Which is that all living beings are always kind of making false and arbitrary assessments of things. We point at this and say, oh, that's pretty great. Oh, this isn't so great. Oh, something really amazing happened to me the other day. I found $10. It's a big, great gain in my life. Oh, the next day, it's a big problem, though, because I lost the $10. And now I'm way worse off than I was two days ago before I found the $10, because now I've lost $10 instead of just coming back even, right? And he says that the problem is that people keep doing this over and over for lifetime after lifetime through countless kalpas, transmigrating through the realms over and over again, making these same sort of mistakes, right? And so what happens that makes a bodhisattva is that you keep making these assessments and you feel pain, right? It's, sometimes it's not that noticeable, but over time you realize that it, it brings more and more pain into your life, the lives of other people. This is kind of you know, a major source of where all of our pain comes from. It's just So much of it is due to our sort of arbitrary assessments of things from one day to the next. But at a certain point, we step outside of ourselves and look at how other people are going through the exact same thing and think, wow, I'd really like to be able to do something about this. And this is the first condition of bodhicitta, which is, you know, in every every sutra and shastra that talks about the bodhisattva path, is looking and seeing somebody else And having that identification oneself saying, I could do something about this. I could help. Let me do my best to try to help because this person has the same experience I have. And so the Buddha says that actually all this time, making all of these assessments, saying, ah, this was good, this was bad, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out this was actually training to be a bodhisattva. All those painful experiences were actually teaching you something. You probably weren't enjoying the lesson, but the thing is, you can't really escape the truth, right? There's no amount of distorted views that can destroy the truth. Birth and death can't destroy the truth. Things are the way they are. And we can either get with the program or keep suffering, right? This is sort of the message. But the thing is, making all of those assessments was sort of training, right? And here's actually, this is straight from the text. They observe how attributes of things such as these 
give rise to things such as those. How attributes of things such as these stabilize things such as those. How attributes of things such as these change things such as those, and how attributes of things such as these extinguish things such as those. And I think that's sort of the key lesson that you've been learning all of this time, right? The pain of living through all of those mistakes teaches you the relationship between the things of the world, the relationship between your wants, your desires, your arbitrary roller coaster ride of emotions that you're going through day after day, potentially lifetime after lifetime. And then you're seeing other people do that as well. And when you have that moment where you understand, you know, it was this, it was really building this up into something that it wasn't that caused the crash two days later. And I'm seeing somebody else doing that. What can I do to help? Maybe you can have some fun right now, but then be there for that person when you know they're going to, they're going to come crashing down to the ground later. But the most important thing is that all of these different ways of seeing the situation all point to what the situation really is underneath. And that's sort of the, the trick about, about truth, right? It can't be destroyed by anything. It's always there. And that means that everything is an expression of it in one way or another, sometimes agreeable, sometimes disagreeable. There's a passage later on when the Buddha is talking about recognizing Dharma, recognizing that principle of truth that's underlying all of these things that seem so disconnected in life. And he says that the Dharma is like water that can wash away dirt and grime. Whether water is coming from a well, a pond, a stream, a river, a brook, a canal, or an ocean, it can all wash away dirt and grime. And the Dharma is like this. But at the same time, it's sort of wrong to say that uh, despite water having the same nature, that a stream, a river, a well, pond, brook, canal, it would be strange to say that these are all the same thing. They share a similar nature. They're definitely different. They can serve the same purpose if we let them or if we sort of make them, right? So there's a fine line. All of these things are expressions of the truth, but you can't just go around saying that they're all the same thing. We do still need to make distinctions and we do still need to recognize how things are more effective in one situation versus another. And what the sutra was really teaching, and it becomes apparent as you go farther into the sutra, is the core of upaya. And upaya comes from our concern for other people, from looking outside ourselves, and from listening. We have the unfortunate position that whether we want to or not, uh, we're the scientists in the world. We're constantly having to see how things work and try to figure out how best to navigate what's happening in life. We can do that together through helping each other. And that's really the core of how we learn the fastest, right? What's the fastest way to supreme great awakening? Well, the first thing is to start paying attention to other people. And the next thing is to learn from each other's mistakes to move forward. It's right there. I mean, I, I took much more than three sentences to say it, but the Buddha could do it in three with a little bit of explanation. Svaha. The first step in the acquisition of wisdom is silence. The second, listening. The third, memory. The fourth, practice. The fifth, teaching others. <laughs>